I now give the floor to, to Michael Scannell, who is, as I said earlier on, Director for Food Chain in Digisante. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leo. Uh, I get straight to the point because uh, obviously we have limitations on our time. In my role as Director for International Stakeholder Relations in DG Sante, one of my tasks is to ensure that uh, imports are safe. And that brings me into contact with um, African countries because we import significant quantities of agri-food products from the continent. But in reading the background uh, document documentation to this particular event, I was struck by the very heavy emphasis on the foodborne uh, diseases. And I couldn't stop reflecting on an event that I'm going to attend in a, a couple of weeks uh, here in Brussels, uh, organized by Public Affairs Brussels, on food safety scandals in Europe. Because yes, we do have food safety problems in Europe. But the two, let's say, cases that are uh, portrayed uh, in this particular seminar uh, relate to uh, a food contamination incident with fipronil, which is uh, an insecticide in eggs uh, and, poultry, and poultry meat, and horse meat. And if you Google either of these issues, fipronil, horse meat scandal in Europe, you'll get a huge number of hits. But it's important to keep in mind that neither of those incidents led to any deaths nor hospitalizations. Nobody died, nobody got sick. Yet, they triggered huge media attention in Europe, a very strong political reaction. So you might ask, what's that got to do with this particular event? Well, it highlights just how seriously food safety is taken in Europe. And in turn, why? It's because citizens demand extremely high levels of food safety. And in turn, they put pressure on politicians to ensure that food is safe. And they, in turn, put pressure on civil servants like me to ensure that regulatory systems are in place, working with our member states, our private sector, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we've been very successful. As I say, now something like a horse, the horse meat scandal, the feedman incident, nobody died, nobody got sick. That's, uh, that's uh, let's say, a major event. If two people, 2,000 people a day were dying, as appears to be the case in sub-Saharan Africa from foodborne uh, diseases, you can imagine the scandal that would happen here in Europe. If 20 people died in a year from a particular foodborne disease incident, there would be very big questions asked as to how it happened. And I just emphasize again, it's all down to citizens and their insistence on food safety. And it's only when citizens in Africa similarly demand extremely high standards in relation to food safety that you will see the kind of progress we have seen in Europe. That brings me to the trade dimension, because, of course, we trade. And I think the European example uh, is uh, relevant to what I would hope will be the African experience. As European integration has progressed over the decades, Food safety has been a critical element because, again, I get back to citizens. They all eat. They understand food. It's cultural. It's health. And with each successive wage uh, or wave of European integration, our own internal market completed in 1992, the subsequent enlargement to Eastern Europe, one of the critical issues citizens insisted on, if we're going to see increased trade liberalization, it better be safe, particularly in the area of food. And that gives rise again to what I said earlier. If we get it wrong, a very high price is paid. Citizens question, you took an excessive risk, you've exposed us to unacceptable risks, and a political price is paid for it. That's reflected also in our policy towards imports from wherever in the world, including Africa. We have a very heavy responsibility to ensure that it takes place on a safe basis. Nonetheless, the trade takes place. So when I'm asked, as I frequently am, what is your trading relationship with Africa? Are your sanitary and phytosanitary requirements putting in place unacceptable uh, barriers to trade? Are they excessive? Well, my answer, frankly, is there's a huge volume of trade. It takes place on a safe basis. We cannot afford and will not take risks, unacceptable risks, in relation to the import conditions governing such trade. 
nor indeed would that be in the interest of African countries. You don't want to be associated with lower standards. Any African product on the European market must be safe. Any product in the European market must be safe. We cannot allow a distinction to be made between safe European product and unsafe African products. And you will find, and do find, a huge range of African products in Europe, agri-food products. We need these products. I'm speaking here of fish, coffee, cocoa, spices, tropical fruits and uh, vegetables, etc., etc. Even very sensitive products like beef, which developed countries often have difficulties exporting to Europe. We import from Namibia, Botswana, Swaziland. So African countries can meet our requirements, and we're happy to work with them to faci facilitate their exports to Europe. But I emphasize again, uh, under safe conditions. Now, the, the, the paper uh, presented to us today highlighted very usefully certain of the challenges that face African countries. And again, making this distinction between which do you tackle first or which do you prioritize, exports or the foodborne disease situation in your own country. I think the two are, are not incompatible. And again, I get back to the European experience. With our own integration, our successive wage, uh, waves of accession of new member states, they all had to up their game. They had to improve their standards. It was a precondition of their accession to the EU that they had to basically comply with the existing European regulatory framework. We invested hugely in enabling them to meet these standards, but they did it. So aiming, if, the mistake I think, I think that sometimes is made in developing countries wishing to export to Europe is to focus on creating niche export sectors. That can work, and it can work for a time, but it has fundamental weaknesses and risks. And where we see developing countries, our trade partners, putting our place, let's say, sustainable exports to Europe, it's because over time they break down the barriers between their export sector and the standards it complies with and their own domestic standards. It's very challenging for a regulatory authority to manage a dual safety system. This is what goes to export. It has to meet higher standards. This is what's for domestic markets. We don't care. It doesn't work over time. And Political systems, and again I get back to citizens' demands, should be ambitious to essentially ensure that what's on local markets is safe, and as safe as what we are exporting. And if you can aspire and aim for that kind of a situation uh, over time and with investment, you put in place sustainable uh, export markets. Now the Commission in its own efforts, I, say, I just deal with the import uh, side of things, I don't get directly involved in how African countries strengthen their own food safety systems, but my colleagues in DEVCO invest hugely in this area. Uh, they don't allow themselves to be frankly tempted to go down this route. We can and should invest only in the export potential of these countries. They realize and accept that uh, it's more important, and I think it is, to strengthen the food safety systems in these countries for the benefit of their own citizens. Uh, accepting that will, in turn, create a better export uh, climate. That's not to say we ignore the export dimension, but that's why we have a DG Trade in the European Commission, which invests hugely in uh, trade facilitation, uh, works with African countries through our economic partnership agreements to strengthen export potential uh, in your countries. And, of course, we work at the multilateral level, and there I would emphasise one project only, the Standards and Trade Development Facility, which brings together the major uh, uh, global multilateral organisations in Geneva, uh, and I think very usefully addresses not just the trade dimension, but also the health dimension, the agricultural production system. So you found, find around the same table the WHO, the FAO, the, w, uh, the OIE, the European Commission, and, and, and major uh, donor countries, which aims to get a more holistic approach uh, towards these related issues. A couple of concluding remarks, because I know we're under time pressures. I think we can and should be optimistic. I can point to, for example, China has made enormous progress over the past 15 years. When we first started going and looking at food safety standards 
in China and its exports towards Europe. Frankly, what we saw was extremely worrying. What we now see is very encouraging. And again, I get back to citizens. Uh, China learned, notably in response to a food safety crisis, at the time melamine and inf infant formula, that uh, citizens' uh, concerns in relation to food safety was now a big political issue, and they responded accordingly. And they also realized over time that this duality of a domestic market and an export market isn't especially effective, and you have to aim, aim to common high standards. So it can be done. Uh, uh, second point uh, I'd emphasize, we're not dealing with a static situation. Uh, in Europe, we remain very alert to new challenges, new risks. Uh, we can never afford to be complacent in relation to food safety. Any regulator that tells you that food is safe forever, you know, sack them, get rid of them, because something will happen to remind them that, no, that's not the case. New risks arise. And this happens also with our imports from Africa. New risks are emerging. Probably the full uh, army worm is a particular concern currently, citrus black spot in citrus exports to Europe. But we have to find ways of dealing with them. And then finally, uh, technology. And I, I appreciate the, 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 the next panelists will address these issues. We need to and will invest hugely in uh, research and innovation. In Europe itself, in our projected uh, expenditure plans for what we call our next financial framework, which will run from 2021. We're going to invest 99 billion over seven years in research and innovation. And we have five major chapters under which this 99 billion euro will be spent. One is food and natural resources. Again, reflecting the importance of the sector, both economically and its sensitivity for citizens. This is an area, if you get it wrong, the price is simply too high to pay. And that's why Europe will be investing hugely in innovation in these areas. And I think African countries should look to the opportunities for exploiting this spending to help address your concerns. And again, to finalize, let's not forget the sustainability development goals. Everything we do in the Commission, the European Commission these days, has to find a niche, has to relate to these goals. We have to see our work in an international, multilateral context. And food is critical. Food security, food safety is critical to the uh, sustainability development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the presentation and uh, for the references on, on research and innovation and the, the trade dimension and the need for more robust national food systems.